Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to Cave of the Cross Apologetics, where we take the books that have been sitting on your shelves that you really wanted to read. You'll get to it someday, and we'll make you open it. So that's what we're doing here. Yeah. And so uh, uh, we're uh, in the middle of our books, uh, of, of our new book here, uh, Against All Opposition by uh, Greg Bonson. And so this is kind of the, the uh, good primer for... Uh, presuppositional apologetics, which is kind of uh, the 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 new version of apologetics, uh, because I tend to think of the kind of the classical um, two step process: uh, prove that uh, God is possible or a God is possible, and then you mix in some uh, uh, evidence of the resurrection, and poof, you got Christian. Right. Scramble it all together, and you got yeah, yeah. yeah or you you're, you're yeah. collecting your facts and get your you're kind of put you it, your put apologetic it omelet. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Uh, it could be uh, multiple different uh, paths, uh, pe- people kind of like an, uh, uh, an accumulative uh, process so that you can um, uh, go for science, you can go for history, you can go for morality, depending on what you want. But presuppositional apologetics uh, has a very um, clear and distinct difference is that uh, it, it builds up from an idea of a worldview uh, with certain presuppositions that you can't get away from and uh, from there. Um, you're, you're tying uh, the ideas of science, logic, morality to your ultimate source, which for Christians is the Bible. And we're trying to get the other side, whoever we might be encountering, to start looking at those assumptions as right. well. So, 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 yeah. So, you know, basically there is defensive apologetics where you're kind of defending the faith and you're saying, you know, this is why the resurrection, you know, could happen and that sort of thing. Um this is why we believe God exists. So there's, but uh, presuppositionalism often, at least from my perspective, seems more offensive. You're all, you're taking the battle to them, as it were, and you're asking the question. You know, uh, how do you defend what you are believing? Right? Mm-hmm. How do you defend your pre basic presuppositions? And you really don't let them get away with you know making assumptions that belong to to the Christian faith without them at least uh, or bringing to their attention that they have to defend those assumptions, right? Like right. rationality and morality and that sort of thing. Yeah. Most of the um, moral arguments for the existence of God that I've seen really are presuppositionalism, although the folks that use them for the most part are not presuppositionalists, <laughs> right. and they would yell at me, you know, if, right. if they heard me say that. But many of them, because the question that you're really asking in those arguments is, what has to be the case for morality to, you know, to exist? Mm-hmm. Well, that's kind of a transcendental, presuppositional kind of right. question. And so that's kind of, in, in my mind anyway, that's a yeah. presuppositionalist approach, yeah. right? And, and it's not just presuppositions that, that can use this, uh, as, as you were saying, with the morality one, or I think of history. Uh, uh, you could have people that say, unless if it's shown to me on video, well, okay, then nothing before uh, the advent video of, of video in yeah. the 1940s yeah, yeah. Uh, could history ever exist. Is that what you're really saying? And yeah. we're asking them to live in in that understanding of, of what the implications of of their worldview from. And so we are calling out then uh, certain things that, th- that um, they seem to borrow from our presupposition where we think it's everything mm-hmm. uh, because ultimately every uh, truth is God's truth. And so that's kind of what uh, uh, we're introducing here through Greg Bonson, who's introducing uh, through a series of lectures that we're taking and uh, Gary DeMar and his group at American Vision have uh codified it into a, a series of books and this one being the, the first one in a series of three and uh, we're on chapter two of our yes. book uh, against called, all opposition yes right? that's right uh, yeah. we're defending the, the Christian worldview right and uh, he, he says in uh, chapter two here that it is impossible to think without presuppositions so presuppositions is a, a really important part to the presuppositional worldview or the, the, the <laughs> apologetics. Yeah. And so in here, we're, we're going to clarify what presuppositions are, uh, who has them, what to do with them, where to start, everything like that. So, mm-hmm. um, so uh, we're, we're in chapter two here. So kind of looking back at where we were in pre- the previous chapter, we saw that people see faith as irrational because it's contrary to laws of logic or it conflicts with empirical ev- evidence or they're trying to straw man what, 
faith is and they don't really <laughs> have a proper understanding of what's meant by faith or that faith is believing what is absurd just to be absurd yeah. just for the sake of it. If, right. if it's, if it's not absurd, there, then I, it, I can't yeah. have faith in yeah. it. Right. Yeah. It's the, the movie idea of, of faith. It's like, Oh, okay. Uh, this probably would have happened regardless, but there's a little tinge of movie magic in it to, to make you think, <laughs> or, or was it? But faith is also sometimes seen as contrary to proof, and that is slightly different concept from the ones that we have considered right. so far. So this fourth notion, then, you know, he says is a is a different category. People who hold this view don't say that the Christian faith entails believing what is untrue. Rather, they say it entails believing something contrary to proof, right? In other words, you can't prove it kind of thing, right? And so he tells us that people will, will often protest against the presence of any attitude of faith in a person's view of God or his philosophy, maintaining, he says, very arrogantly, mm -hmm. right, and also, to be honest, naively, that they will not believe anything that has not first been fully proven to them, right? I need proof. If you can't fully prove it to me, then I'm not going to believe it, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they'll be led by proof, not by faith, is what their claim is, right? And so he says, you know, uh, these kind of people say, you know, I'm not like weak-minded people, you Christians, right? <laughs> right? I need proof, right? And so, and uh, and that's kind of the classical approach is to try to give them proof, mm -hmm. right? And, and and Bonson is suggesting, well, wait a minute, let's take, take a step back from that, yeah. right? And again, with presuppositionalism, we're not opposed to evidence. In fact, right. um, once you um, kind of assert the, the starting basis for presuppositionalism, uh, evidence becomes very important. It's very yeah. clear. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 why we can talk about things like the minimal facts arguments that uh, that uh, um, you know evidentialists uh, uh, tend to to really like. Or um, we can uh, talk about uh, the the the. Uh, uh, essence of uh, morality and and how how uh, the Christian worldview has uh, uh, led to the ideas of Western thoughts that we we've uh, we've built a civilization mm -hmm. uh, upon um, and uh, especially uh, post uh, fall of Rome and so so there's know, lots of proof uh, right if the, we the, really want proof there's lots of proof the question right. is what kind of proof right. what do you mean by proof yeah. right and and it's starting off on the right foot <clears throat> it's 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 not it's it's not allowing the other side to 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 grab the the the, the foundation that it's on without building it first right. or or recognizing it and so uh, that's what we can do and so having a transcendental um, uh, look or tag um, as we talk to uh, yes Dr Anderson yes yes yeah. exactly yeah, yeah we talked to Dr Anderson about uh, tag and um, his he likes the morality argument from from there uh, and so um, we. Um, we're, we're not opposed to uh, evidence or looking at things like uh, did Jesus exist or what, what was um, what was the second temple Judaism in relationship to how apostle Paul understood the second coming or, you know, something along those lines. Uh, but, but we're, we're starting off on the right foot and saying, here's the basis for how we can know things like science, logic, uh, uh, history, um, morality, and, and, and those things. So where did it all go wrong? Well, we have to turn to the Enlightenment. All right. Which, who, who can be opposed to Enlightenment? Well, there was a lot of things wrong in the Enlightenment as well. But people who say this sort of thing that, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, that I, you know, give me enough proof and then, then I'll believe. Uh, they, they kind of go back to this uh, spirit of René Descartes. And Descartes uh, was a philosopher who was often considered the father of the Enlightenment. In fact, mm -hmm. In my um, uh, modern worldview class, we pinpointed him in his cabin for three days as the the epicenter for the transition to the modern worldview. Mm. And certainly, he's the father of an autonomous spirit of philosophy. And he was a French scholar or theoretician uh, who kicked off the age of reason. In fact, my intro class, there's the intro Ooh. book. I paid three dollars and seventy five cents for probably what's a uh, three-page uh, uh, online article now, but uh, Descartes' meditation on, on first philosophy uh, went into the woods by himself, thought himself down, 
thought himself back up Went to into everything. Went a stove is what he called it. I mean, you know. <laughs> I, I, Which we would call now a cabin yeah. with a stove, I, right? I, 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 you have to give him credit. You have to appreciate what he did. I mean, you know, here's here's this guy in France and, and, and a Catholic who who's going to revolutionize everything. <laughs> Three days. That's all it takes for you to become a household name <laughs> back then. <laughs> so, so he is the one that kind of kicks off this uh, this uh, uh, named Age of Reason. Yeah. And so uh, Descartes here uh, was concerned that people should strive to realize that uh, and to follow a reliable method for arriving at their beliefs. And so mm-hmm. that, that's what he was trying to do and accomplish. And according to him, that method requires doubting and criticizing everything you could possibly could or accept nothing to be true that you did not clearly recognize to be true because it survived the method of doubt. In fact, right. reading his, his book that, I mean, that's what he does. He's, he says, Oh, I know all these things, but I could be deceived. I could, you know, the evil genie could come out. I uh, could be dreaming. Yeah, right. Yeah. But it, you know, the, it's, it's your classical <laughs> matrix uh, storyline here. <laughs> Um, you know, if, if you read Descartes, uh, you're, you're going to be thrust into um, uh, matrix territory, which That's right. uh, when I was going through my philosophy cl- classes, um, uh, it, it was out. So we knew enough. to. Yeah. So, to, I, to so you wonder, about. how did Descartes know about the matrix? <laughs> yeah, you know, it was right. written, you know, long after. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Probably exactly. the other way around. Maybe. Though, right? maybe. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> maybe it's all a dream and everything's <laughs> taking place. All right. So, uh, so if, if, uh, we can't clearly recognize it to be true, then uh, we have to, it has to survive this uh, method of doubt. If we had to get uh, had a way of getting down to the things that we can't give up, the thing that is unquestionable, then we could build on top of that mm-hmm. little by little. And that's exactly what he tries to do. We would have a secure foundational knowledge that we could use for encountering the world. In fact, um, while I m- might not be able to prove that your mind exists, I could, for the sake of argument, say, let's assume that both of us really do exist. I'm going to put forth this to you. And so I'm going to give you an equal platform to start with. And so here I've put myself at the center and I'm building up from me. And for us Christians, we might have a little bit of an issue with that. Right, right. And so, you know, Descartes was trying to, he asked himself, what is the foundation of knowledge, right? What's, what's the basis of knowledge? And so this doubting, really, there was a, an issue <clears throat> between rationalism and empiricism that he was working through. And he, he was criticizing empiricism, right, our experience, mm-hmm. right? And he said, basically, we can doubt all of our experience, right? All the things that we can see, taste, touch, feel, all of our empirical, you know, uh, sensory experience. Yeah. And so he, wanted, so he says we, that those can't be the foundation that cannot be the foundation right. of knowledge there has to be something that is more secure he wanted he was looking for what he called an archimedean point right <laughs> and so he systematically doubted and uh then a door opened to certainty he thought he, he thought of something that could not be doubted and that was you know his own existence right uh, uh you know uh, if you are doubting everything, basically his arguments, he, he, he uh, concluded, I can doubt everything but, the, but doubting. And doubting is thinking, and therefore, you know, I'm a thinking being, that, ex- and I have to exist in order to think. And so for Descartes, the foundation of everything was himself, right? right? right. I think, therefore, I am. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there's, uh, as Bonson tells us, there's a modern man for you. Right. He is the center. He's the foundation. I am the foundation. Right. 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 The, if, if, if I can doubt then there must be an I to exist for right. me to doubt. Right. So the evil genie could be could be uh, uh, pulling the wool over my eyes for I'm sitting in this chair, I'm eating an apple, um, I'm feeling pain. All those things could uh, could could be false uh, sensory um, uh, per- perversions on on a massive scale. But the very fact that I can doubt my, my even my existence means. Oh, I, th- I can't doubt that existence because right. fr- from from that initial starting point, I must exist in order for 
something to occur. Now, uh, Bonson does take him to task on mm-hmm. this, right? He says that he went just a little bit. He didn't go <laughs> as far as he should have, right? He should have ended by saying something like, doubting is going on. So he kind of assumed the I, right. which is a criticism that a lot of folks a have lot of people, d- yeah. done. Yep, uh, absolutely. Him, right? yep. <laughs> yeah. I think, therefore, I am. Whoa, whoa. You lost me no, at the word I. So. Thinking is going oh, on. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe on the fourth day, yeah, he could right. have one more day. So so his his real, his second criticism is to suggest that this doubting everything is really for fools, right? I mean, that's what he says. He says, modern-day followers of Descartes who say that they will doubt absolutely everything and accept nothing without proof are really acting foolishly, Right. Why? Well, because no one can doubt everything. (laughs) So, and he tells us to try the experiment and see if you can doubt (laughs) everything. Uh, But of course, if you were to doubt everything, you wouldn't be uh, thinking at all, much less doubting, he says. He says a fundamental set of beliefs is inescapable for everything. So you have to have a fundamental basic set of beliefs. Every person, he says, has a logically basic set of convictions by which he thinks and lives his life. Right. So people delude themselves (laughs) when they say that they will not accept anything without proof or demonstration because you see they don't prove their foundational principles in the way they think they do. They do have a place for faith in their outlook and in living their lives. I can trust that I have arrived at the, I think, therefore I am. I have arrived at a point in time where I know science to be the case. I have arrived at the place where I know that uh, the, the logic exists within the universe and I'm able to use it. Well, can you? <laughs> does your Does your system allow for those things? And, and are you sure that... You're standing on a, a, a firm foundation there. When you start challenging something they believe, they say, well, but everybody knows that's true. Yeah, we yes. all agree on this. Yeah, we all agree that logic is, you know, right. is is uh, the basis of, oh, really? Well, uh, you know, where, where'd that come from? Right? <laughs> right. Why do you hold to that? Why is that acceptable? Mm-hmm. Well, everybody holds to logic. I mean, you, well, okay, but the question is why, right? Right. <laughs> right. So, you know, it, t- take 500 years away. Everyone believed that God exists. We're just going with that. Yeah, so, yeah. so if if you wouldn't won't let us have that, then why should we let you have this? Well, everyone knows this to be the case. Right. Let's right. let's go back a step further and see: is it true? Like, how how do we know these things? Um, at, at what's what's our starting point that we launch off to to allow for everybody to know this to be the case? Of course, when they do that, when when you start challenging them and, and say, well, you know, here's, here's, a, here's the, the truth of the matter because you can't live without it or what it might be. Um, when you start doing this, they have just walked into a trap because it's not enough to say that everyone knows this or that. It's how are these things known according and accounted for, for a, in, in a, a matter only worldview. So, mm-hmm. so this, this, uh, th- th- what you see is what you get in the universe. It's, it's all made of stardust, uh, uh, rocket fizz, what, 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 you know, <laughs> we're all space broccoli, what, uh, you know, and pick your uh, uh, delineation of, of our origin, and all it is is matter. Okay, the brain. Well, it's it's not the brain, but uh, it, there's there's chemicals and and chemicals um, um, spot and and fizz and 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 <laughs> when you're feeling love towards your wife, it's just a chemical reaction, that's and right. that's all it is. But that's right. to have things like a mind or uh, a, a universal constants of logic. I mean, those things, how do those things exist in a matter only world? Uh, you know, can we go to the other side of the moon and scoop up the law of non-contradiction and put it <laughs> into a Petri dish and say, yep, there it is. There it is. Yeah. Well, how, how can we okay. al- rely on that? How can we, how can we have a universal concept when, when we were talking to Scott Christensen about the universality of stories? Why, why does mankind have this, overabundant need to, to uh, convince each other based in story, story form. Well, there seems to be more than just that, but here is the other side saying all it is is matter. And this is where we have to start with. And, and, and it's through that process, the, the, the scientific process that uh, we can only find truth in, in this matter. Mm. Well, how do you account for the thing like 
science accounts for those things. Right, right. So the, the, the question here in this next session is, uh, what is the reason you know something, right? What's the reason you know something? Everybody, he says, knows that, okay. But <laughs> if everybody knows that, then you ought to have a very good reason for the thing that everybody knows, right? And so what is that reason for what you say you know? When so many in the world take it for granted that you can trust, for instance, your senses, unbelievers don't understand it. When we come along and say, on our worldview, why do you trust your senses, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, They have a foundational faith, he tells us, but they think theirs is reasonable. Well, mine is reasonable because everybody trusts their senses, right? Right. They know that, uh, that we have a foundational faith, but according to them, ours, he tells us, is unreasonable, mm-hmm. right? And so, you know, is that fair? Yeah, yeah. And, and again, remember what faith is. Faith is trust. Do you have a reason for faith? Well, he, here's my reasons. Uh, I have a, a spiritual experience that, that changes me. That could be a one one factor. Um, the I have the Bible that speaks to me right. and, and, you know, enlightens me and tells me what, what God is doing and right. saying. And, uh, yeah. the, the, the facts of it, uh, 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 that Jesus existed, he rose and died. He said uh, these things would occur. They have occurred. Um, all, all these things uh, add to your level of, of faith, of, of trust. And so what you're saying then is, okay, you're trying to account for everything uh, in this matter only uh, universe, and you're saying that science gets you that way. Well, what basis do you have for that trust? It seems to be harkening back to their definition of what faith is, believing something without really knowing it, seems to be the case because it's like, well, this is just the most useful tool that we have, uh, uh, but we don't really know. And so uh, the the standard by which they want you to, to uh, support all basis seems to be um, a, 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 a standard by which uh, has no foundation in of its uh, of itself either, hmm. and their outlook, their worldview doesn't account for it, and right. so we'll get into that more. So there is another kind of irrationality that we are sometimes accused of having because we hold to the Christian faith. There are people who say, "I can't go along with you and accept the Christian faith because we are not to make assumptions in our reasoning." But you Christians assume all sorts of things. Right. The problem with this, he tells us, is you can't think or reason without presuppositions, (laughs) without assumptions, right? He says, as you might guess from what he said about, you know, the I don't believe anything that's contrary to proof position, he's going to say something similar about this, you know, this uh, presuppositional uh, position, right? He says it's really impossible to think think without assumptions or presuppositions. Our demonstration of everything we believe is by means of other beliefs. So I know this based on this belief, and I know this ba- that belief based on this belief, and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. And so he says, I prove this by appealing to this, and then I prove this by appealing to this, and so on. And it's important to prove every belief by uh, independent beliefs. He says that's impossible to do. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think we used this example a long time ago, but uh, pr- prove to me that your name is your name. Yeah. Well, I, I have an understanding of who my parents are, and they t- they've told me what my names are. Yeah. Okay, can you prove then that those are your parents? Yeah. Well, the, my earliest memories of them are, to, <laughs> are are that they were my parents, and they were very loving towards me. And so, uh, yes, uh, they're my parents. Well, okay, th- that that's just reliance on your memory. But th- there was a time where you didn't have memory that you're just relying that these were the same people and they didn't kidnap you. Well, uh, on my birth certificate, they say, (laughs) okay, so you're appealing to a government, which of course never lies and never gets uh, paperwork wrong. And uh, the hospital never uh, switches out uh, parents. And And so, and so, uh, you know, you, you're, you're, you're consistently going back and, and appealing to, to, to something more. And so can you appeal to something even before that? Or are you kind of stuck? Right. Right. So uh, it's impossible to think without presuppositions, and that's exactly what we're seeing here, is that if an unbeliever considers Christianity irrational simply on the basis that it allows for something to be accepted without independent demonstration, then the unbeliever is being unrealistic. He must be pressed to see that he ends up refuting himself, not simply Christianity, but those values and demands he relies on and uses. And so the unbeliever says, the problem is that you're using presuppositions when you're trying to defend faith. 
And then you must show that the unbelievers are using presuppositions as well. It comes down to this. If you're using presuppositions means you're being irrational. And I have shown that you are using presuppositions person on the other side, the, the unbeliever, then you are rational too. And so that's, that's kind of a, a one of the, the roles that presuppositions tend tend to, to focus on. Right. He says, once you've shown that uh, the person, you know, his or her presuppositions, uh, then he says, this will be the response. But ours are different, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> because everyone agrees with ours. Yours are the ones under question. Right. So they're trying to, you know, switch the, you know, the, uh, the burden of proof there, right? <clears throat> he says, that seems a little bit arbitrary, right? It's, it's a bit unfair. We, we aren't playing on a level playing field when they say, well, mine is the one that everyone, everybody believes. Everyone right? knows really? the sun goes around the earth. Everybody yeah. knows this. Yeah. <laughs> So if an unbeliever considers Christianity irrational because Christians allow something to be accepted without independent demonstration, the unbeliever in question is being unrealistic. He is being hypocritical, not living up to his own demands. And that's kind of the, the, the two-step approach here for presuppositions is, okay, according to your standard, we're not to have presuppositions. Here you have presuppositions. Therefore, you're being irrational according yeah. to your own standard. Yeah. yeah. And so, so we're you just haven't lived up them, to your own standards. Yeah. We're asking them to, to to live within their own standard and then we're testing that through an internal mechanism. An internal critique. Right. right? Yeah. yeah. And, and showing it to to not uh, substantiate the basis for which they're claiming. And so there it's not uh, here are all my facts and I'm peppering them with you and, and you're you you don't have an answer, boom, therefore there is no answer. <laughs> Well, no, we're saying, okay, you believe this. Let's see what the case of that would be. And you don't have a, a, a basis for this. Well, do I have a basis for uh, science, logic, morality, you know, history, what have you? And we're saying yes. And then there might be some issues of stealing across <laughs> worldviews here. So, uh, so the person is being hypocritical, not living up to his own demands. He's the one who is being supremely unreasonable, actually unreasonable. The problem is that is not that we as Christians believe things without evidence. The problem is that unbelievers don't like the kind of evidence we have. Right. So we have evidence, he says. They just don't like it. Mm -hmm. So he says there isn't anyone who can prove everything he believes by independent considerations. You just can't do that. Again, you you know, in order to to think and and um, and reason, you have to have uh, presuppositions. They're inevitable and necessary. Mm -hmm. And so he says what the unbeliever objects to finally is the kind of evidence to which we appeal as Christians, believing something based on God's uh, personal authority rather than on the basis of impersonal and universally accepted, but not demonstrated <laughs> norms of observation, logic, and utility, right? That's the problem that they have. I have evidence for what I believe, he says, great evidence, the very word of God, but they don't want that kind of evidence. That sort of evidence is founded on a person, the living God. It's not like going to, you know, a dictionary or encyclopedia and kind of looking something up. Right. Right. <laughs> right. All right. Um, so I think we'll pause here um, uh, because this is kind of one of the longer chapters uh, and, and uh, we're about half an hour in. Um, and so uh, this one will split up into two chapters and we'll come back and, uh, and talk more about presuppositions and, and how to, um, kind of uh, approach these types of conversations and, and kind of what to look for uh, next time. So thanks for joining us and uh, um, continue to uh, um, keep uh, reading along with us. Uh, uh, nice thing about this book is it's geared towards uh, a, 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 an introduction uh, to people for, for the subject. So there's things like definitions and questions uh, in the back. And so um, um, as, as you're going through, um, it's good uh, to kind of ch check yourself with those questions in, in the back as well. And, of course, you can always watch our stuff again, cavethecross.com or on the YouTube or uh, that we split up the, the clips uh, of, of, of this episode throughout uh, the week as well. Um, so thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. See you next time.